Hey buckaroos and buckarettes, it's good to be back with you. And this time I'd like to talk to you about mass moments of inertia and where they come from. Um, I get this question a lot from uh, my students and frankly from a lot of you and I don't know, I don't blame you. Mass moment of inertia isn't a very intuitive thing, at least not at first. So let's, let's talk about just a, the basic physics of it first and then I'll show you a little bit of math about where they come from. Okay, I got a tire here. This is a uh, a uh, tire from a racing go-kart. Okay, it's a Bridgestone, I don't know what this is. Little speedy uh, tire, okay? It's round, okay? It's, it's axisymmetric. Now, if I want to spin this tire about its own axis like this, like this, okay? The moment required is very, very low because uh, there's not much resistance to rotational acceleration. All I have to do to make it harder to, to, to spin is rather than spinning it about its own axis, hold it out like that and now spin it, okay? It's now a yeah, couple of feet, seven, seven, eight hundred millimeters away from the axis of rotation. And it takes a lot more force at a distance, so a lot more moment to spin it. Its mass moment of inertia went up because of the distance from the axis of rotation, okay? Now, why is it called a mass moment of inertia? Well, the, it, the answer lies in the, in the way mathematicians have decided to name things that have an, uh, some quantity multiplied by some quantity squared. That gets called a moment of inertia. So there is an area moment of inertia. There is a mass moment of inertia. If you're into statistics, if you're figuring out uh, aver uh, yeah, averages and standard deviations, you're figuring out moments of inertia. There's a first, second, and even third moments of inertia. It has to do with the way mathematicians name things. Now, would I call it that? Absolutely not. If, if, if it were up to me, I'd call it rotational mass. That's a lot more utilitarian name. Um, but nobody asked me, so we're stuck with mass moment of inertia. But if you want to think of it as a rotational equivalent to mass, or even call it rotational mass, that's not the worst thing in the world. So that's where it came from. When, when mathematicians see the same thing enough times, they give it a name. All right. You know, I'm standing on a floor. Well, who decided to call that a floor? I don't know. A long time ago, somebody, well, I've got this flat thing. I walk around on it all the time. I don't know what it is. I'm going to call it a floor. Okay, now we know how to talk about it. All right? It, it's, it's along those lines. It's kind of a silly example, but there you have it. Okay, so mathematically, where does it come from? Well, there's a lot of ways to explain it. It actually, if you want to be really mathematically uh, precise, it's probably, you probably express it in terms of a double integral or maybe even a triple integral depending on what you're looking at. That would be correct without being helpful. So here's what I'm going to do. Imagine you have a bar here and the bar is going to spin. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, well, what happens to this bar that's spinning if I put a mass on the end of it? So that's where, that's where we're headed here. This mass, or this, I'm sorry, the bar, we're going to assume is rigid and massless, okay? You can get them from Amazon, trust me. Um, the bearing there is frictionless, also from Amazon if you know where to look. This is a concentrated mass. It's small and dense, so it weighs a lot, but it isn't very big, okay? So it weighs a lot and not very big. Like, imagine this tennis ball were made out of something really dense, you know, steel. Okay, I would say plutonium, but I wouldn't want to get near it. Then let's, let's stick with steel, okay? It takes hardly anything to do that. Its own moment of inertia is basically zero. But when I put it out at an angle, at a distance here, and start trying to swing it around, the, the effect is quite pronounced. So here's what we're going to do. Okay, so I've got a bar whose length is R. It's rigid and massless because I got it from Amazon. The bearings also frictionless. And we're doing all this to, so we can, don't have to worry about these ancillary effects. We're really only looking at the effect of that uh, mass there. And it's just, think of it as a lump of really dense metal, you know, tungsten or something. Okay, now this capital M stands for moment. Okay, we're going to apply a moment to the uh, end of that bar right there near the pivot. Okay, and if you want to call this a torque, that's, that's another, another word that gets used for that. Okay. Um, Unfortunately, moment and mass both start with M. Sorry, there's 26 letters in the alphabet, at least the one I use. So capital M will be moment, and little m will be mass. All right. So 
That's what's going to happen. I'm going to apply a moment to this bar and it's going to spin around. Okay, easy enough. Well, let's look at what's going on with just the mass, all right? This little piece of unobtainium, whatever this dense stuff is that we probably also got from Amazon. Um, there's a force on it that way, okay? Which, if you really want to think about it, is actually a shear force in the beam. If you wanted to cut the beam here, there'd be a shear load on it. But the point is, there's a force acting this way, okay, due to that moment. Well, force is a moment divided by a distance, okay? Moment divided by r, all right? That's fine, okay? And this has a mass, so if I say F equals M A. Let's start unpacking this. This is absolutely true at this moment in time. The force acting on that uh, mass right there is going to dictate its acceleration. Okay, what else? I mean, that's Newton's law. Well, let's start putting, let's, let's start casting this in terms of things we know. Well, the force is the mass over the radius. Oops. Okay, it's the mass over the radius. Well, how do I describe acceleration in terms of things, the rotational things? Well, if you go over here a second, you might have seen in a class a long time ago, junior high maybe, um, that the arc length, uh, when we've got a, a mass or a dot traversing an arc like this, the distance it traverses is the radius times the angle theta. Well. If there's anything I know how to do at the end of all this school I've had, I know how to take derivatives. Well, the derivative of r is zero. It, there isn't, it's just a number. So, all right, what's the derivative of distance? Velocity, right? So there's velocity equals r times omega. Okay, so that the der derivative of angular position is angular velocity. Well, it worked once. Let's do it again. All right, so position, velocity, we'll call this acceleration. Okay, so linear acceleration equals the radius times the angular acceleration. Well, guess what we're about to do here? Let's take this and put it over there, okay? So um, we'll call this little m for mass times r alpha. Okay, you see where I'm headed here? One last step, moment equals m r squared alpha. Okay, this is the effect of this mass and its distance from the point of rotation on that moment there, or its reaction to that moment there based on its mass and its distance right there. Well, have we seen that before? You betcha we have seen that before. That right there is I. Okay? That's our mass moment of inertia. Now, is this mathematically super rigorous? Eh, probably not. But is it correct? You bet. So there we go. There's, there's where I comes from. All right? Now, do we make up devices of unobtainium beams and perfect bearings and little masses on the end of them? No, of course not. But what I can do, let's, I'm going to change, I'm going to erase all this. I'm going to make one change, and you're going to go, oh yeah, this is the same thing. So here we go. Here's a, okay, let's say I want to know the mass moment of inertia of a disk, okay? Look at it from the top. Here's a disk, and this, I'll make this as circular as I can, okay? There's the disk, okay? And I'll call it a uniform disk. Maybe I milled that out of a piece of steel or something. And there's a bearing in the middle there. Well, if I want to know the mass moment of inertia of the disk, that's slightly less terrible when I do that, how do you do that? Well, I know how to do mass moment of inertia of a point. Maybe that one right there. And I can, I can figure out what the mass moment of inertia about there due to that point is. Can I do it again? Yeah, not a problem. There it is twice. Can I do it again? Yeah, I can do that. Could I cover that whole disk with little units of mass? 
yeah, and I could add all the effects together. Mm -hmm. That works too. If those little little squares are small enough, that sure looks like a double integral, doesn't it? That looks like an integral in area about the angle here and about the radius there. So if you know how to deal with the mass moment of inertia of a single mass like we just had, you can do any number of masses you want, even if they're infinitesimally small and there's arbitrarily many of them. Do those words sound familiar? The better. Okay, so that's where mass moment of inertia comes from mathematically. And if you want to think of it in uh, physical terms, you can think about it as a resistance to rotational acceleration. That's, that's not a bad working definition of it. So, hope this helps, and I'll see you next time.